let that go into effect and let that take place and let that start to work for us, um, which I do, I do think it works to our advantage. So um, that, uh, you know, and, and one of the things I don't think we should overlook is the current production right now, 554,000 barrels a day in January, 553,000 barrels a day in February. Those numbers are very substantial. That's higher than the last two years, January and February. So that's good for us. Twelve and a half percent of that oil belongs to the state. You know, if I could, if I could say a word there, you know, HB 111 is is uh, there's a lot of moving parts in there. There's not just one or two things in there that we disagree with. On the whole, the major bulk of it is the problem. But there are some things that we really need to look at. We need to look at probably cashable credits. We need to look at NOLs being able to move forward. And there are things we can change, and we probably will. Uh, look at how we're going to change those. But if you take 111 on its face value, it, it, there's, it, it's not the right plan for the state, I don't believe, at this time. And we do have, as Dave has pointed out, uh, increased production. There are other fields which are uh, coming on, that are going to come online in future years. Uh, we have a lot of fines. The programs that we've used in the past have brought some of these fields to come into play now through exploration. So I think there's a whole lot of moving parts right now that 111 is not taking into consideration. And when we're done here this year, I think we may have some changes that I think the state will be able to uh, profit from without having to use uh, 111. And that's our viewpoint anyway. Yeah. Yeah, James. Uh, James Brooks from the Juno Empire. It's looking like the budget is going to reach the floor next week, or if presumably next week. What should we expect from the minority when that happens? Well, I think what you can expect is, is more smart cuts. You know, how can we make government more sustainable? And, and I just want to answer the question. Governor Hammond had it. He has a plan. So we keep talking about a plan. There is a plan. He set aside to make sure that the permanent fund corpus kept growing and that at some point that oil would go down and we would need some other type of income. If you just look at his 50-50 plan, and that's using the earnings that comes out, all the dividends, all that part of it, 50% went as dividends, and the other 50% could be used for essential government. You take that with the revenue that we have, and right now the reason we're not sustainable, because if you add those two together, we're still short. So let's just say for a number, because I don't have the exact ones with me, we're a billion dollars short once we add those two things together. Then that's what comes out of the Constitutional Budget Reserve. And that's the pressure that we should be putting on, is how do we decrease that billion dollars, or whatever that number is, so that we finally get to a point to where our revenue from oil and mining and all the other things that we have, and our actual earnings, just as if we were retired, the money that we would get from our savings account matches up together to be able to meet our obligations. We don't need a bill to do that. Governor Hammond knew that a long time ago. That's where we've been trying to get all this time is to reduce the budget down to essential government so that those two added together gets us to where we need to be. And if I could piggyback on that just a little bit, and I hate to double dip, but you know that's one of the reasons why the news that's going to be coming out of uh, Repsol and Armstrong is so important. The permanent fund that we're proposing to uh, spend in some for fashion, and and uh, as Governor Hammond said, out was a way to pay for government and so forth. If um, the permanent fund is entirely based on royalty oil, so even if we are making more money or less money in uh, credits than we get in prop, uh, production taxes, the royalty oil is a foundation. That's our share, whether or not the oil industry is making money or not, whether they pay taxes or not. We're building out the permanent fund with our royalty oil at uh, you know, 12 and a half percent. That's what's built the permanent fund, and that's why it's important to be providing the investment to get more oil into the pipeline. And just to so. follow up to clarify, I'll ask it more directly. Will the amendments that were voted down in House Finance return on the floor? Well, I'm going to be looking at each and every one of them. But my biggest disappointment on, again, on it is that, from my point of view, is that the majority have already decided that the budget is fine where it's at. They're fine with moving ahead, cutting people's dividend again this year, and they're fine with an income tax. And therefore, there are no more um, cuts to fine. I mean, I've had as low as a couple thousand dollars just to try to be consistent as we're looking at overtime. We're looking at that. They couldn't even say out of a $4.2 billion that we could find that kind of money. So that just shows me as we go through the process, that's all we're doing is going through the process instead of having the true conversation that House Finance needs to have. Hey, James. Um, Nat Hers with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, for Representative Rauscher, for, for any of uh, you for I guess, 
Coming back to the question of the permanent fund advisory vote, is that not just a way to defeat any sort of change to the permanent fund? Because, I mean, we've seen in the past the sort of overwhelming opposition to, the, I think there was like a, a an advisory vote uh, in like the late 90s or something like that. I don't, uh, I thank you for the question. I don't really look at it that way. I mean, the present majority that we have right now, I believe that was uh, what they recommended uh, a year and a half ago or whatever in a letter that uh, the, the, the people should have a say on how this uh, permanent fund interplays with providing for government, and that should come to a vote. Now, that was their understanding, and, and that's my understanding right now, that it's important that they have an under, uh, a word in on this, especially, I, like I said, we're, we're, we're going to, if we're not going to be reducing the size of government, I think it's really important to them realizing how they're going to have to pay for this. And I, I would like to say one other thing. You know, for the past few months, many weeks now, we've been told, when are you going to work on the budget? When are you going to work on the budget? All we do is see these bills on the floor that have nothing to do with the budget. And then all of a sudden, there are two to 300 amendments there. And you say, by golly, they were working on the budget. They were looking at the numbers. They were reading all the sheets. They were reading what was provided. They were crunching all of the, the, the maybe, uh, uh, you know, how, what, what is not being used and what could be taken back and put in other areas. It was, uh, they were working all along. And I, and I think that the uh, permanent fund is going to come into a play on how that's going to pay for what they might not be. You know, these are different times, too. I just want to make sure. The last couple of years, we're talking, not talking just about the earnings reserve. We've been talking about mining tax and motor fuel tax and alcohol tax and income tax and sales tax. And, and so it, it's a whole different attitude right now. You know, and, and people should weigh in because this is going to hit their pocketbooks and it's going to make a determination whether or not they can stay here. So I think the conversation now is much different than what it is before. But I want to thank Representative Sadler. I have to get to finance because we are going to be continuing our amendments, but thank you. Is there, is there any version Liz, we'll of, a, right of a permanent fund plan that, that you could envision your constituents voting for, though? Tell you what, uh, you had two questions, so we'll let Liz take her next one and we'll get back around to you. we got a little bit more time past 930. Okay, I guess uh, my question was for Representative Wilson, so uh, that, that's okay. I'll, I'll uh, along Nat's lines. Is there a plan out there right now that you guys, as a caucus, could support um, utilizing the permanent funds earnings? Well, the people of Alaska uh, have very different views about what the permanent fund is for and how they like to see it used. And our caucus is a large caucus, and we represent those minority, uh, those those diverse viewpoints. So we're talking about that in our caucuses. I can't tell you how the conversation is going, but we're we're considering. And I'll, I'll say that I've, I've had a lot of mixed views from my constituents. Of course, I have a, a very broad, diverse district. Um, but from the people I've heard from, uh, a lot of mixed views. And um, one of the things I think is pretty tough for them is, you know, there are several, several plans that have been laid out there and come out. So it can, be, it can be a little confusing for folks out there for sure. But I've, I've certainly have mixed views from all over the district about, about the uh, permanent fund plans. Yeah. Good deal. Well, I appreciate everyone having the chance to come and, and do this this morning. Um, sorry that our, our finance gal had to leave, but uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next Thursday. Thanks so much.